Hi everyone, it's me, Adrian Lee, the wandering art historian. Thank you so much for coming back for yet another video in our web series, How to Read a Painting. If you watched our previous video, you know that we're taking an intensive look at color and that our next three videos are gonna be very interesting because they will be the primary colors red, yellow, and blue. Why did I choose the primary colors? Well, you know, artists have been fascinated by the primary colors for forever. Um, do, do you know who painted these two paintings? If you said Piet Mondrian, you are correct. Um, Mondrian was a guy who, these are from the 1920s. Um, he was really, interested in reducing art to its most natural forms and in their simplest linear equivalent, which are these vertical and horizontal lines that you see here. And he was fascinated by reducing color to the primary colors and black and white. Now, I think that's really interesting. He actually believed that art would help pave the way for a utopian future. And not just art, but that it would bleed into all forms of design, including furniture, clothing, household goods, and what have you. And he's kind of right. He belonged to this group called Distill, or The Style. And you could remember that because Distill, The Style, was intended to distill art into its purest forms. You see what I did there was a pun, play on words. I love that stuff, right? So here we have Kandinsky stripping all of art down to vertical and horizontal lines and the primary colors. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Adrian, that's orange over there. And it was actually red and it has faded over time. Yeah, just throwing that out there. So. Let's kick things off with the color red, right? Do we remember in our last video, we talked about Kandinsky, remember he has synesthesia and he can hear colors. And do you remember this quote? Just as orange is red brought near to humanity by yellow, so violet is red withdrawn from humanity by blue. And then I showed you this and said, kind of implies that from Kandinsky's perspective, everything shoots out from red, right? Yellow draws red closer to humanity and earth, and that's how we get orange. And blue brings red up to the heavens or more spiritual sacred ideas, and thus we get purple. And then again, that puts our primary colors right in the center, blue, red, yellow. And for the purpose of this video, we're definitely gonna start with red. I feel like that's the right place to start, don't you? I think it's important to Kandinsky. It should be important to us. And red, oof, remember in our previous videos, we said studying color can be challenging because it changed, the meanings change over, the time, over time and meanings change from society and different cultures. Um, cars are often painted bright red. Rosso Corsa, or racing red, was developed by Enzo Ferrari. That makes sense, right? It's Italy's national racing color. That also makes sense. Um, it's often associated with aggression, lust, sensuality, romance, and sex. Think about it. There are countries that have red light districts, and what goes on in those red light districts? Yeah, I don't have to say it, you know. Um, think about the scarlet letter. Mm, yikes, right? It's often associated with military. Um, kings and cardinals and Roman generals wore red, um, but so did the British redcoats. That's how we could see them coming, right? Um, in China, it's a color associated with fertility, fire, joy, and good luck. If you think about the Lunar New Year, they give out uh, red envelopes filled with money as a form of good luck. But it's also associated with the party, which is the communist party. Yikes, not a super positive reference, right? In India, brides wear red, um, but red roses are also a symbol of the Virgin Mary. So very interesting uh, contradiction there. 
The devil is also associated with the color red, and that's since medieval times. Hellfire, damnation, the whole thing. Red, yikes. Um, what does Kandinsky think of the color red, though? Well, he says this. It glows in itself maturely and does not distribute its vigor aimlessly. In music, it is a sound of trumpets, strong, harsh, and ringing. The glow of red is within itself. For this reason, it is a color more beloved than yellow, being frequently used in primitive and traditional decoration, and also in peasant costumes, because in the open air, the harmony of red and green is very beautiful. And that's a very interesting reference because red and green are opposite each other on the color wheel, making them complementary colors. Boy, humans love complementary colors. We're very drawn to them. But there's another thing about the color red, and I want to draw your attention um, to this idea by using these two images. This is known as the Maloon diptych. Diptych mean two, means two. So we have two panels that would be in a frame together um, in a house of worship. Um, church, chapel, tomb, what have you. Um, this is from 1452, Jean Fouquet. Um, on the left panel, we have two gentlemen, okay? One is in blue with some really cool gold outlines. The other is in red. He looks kind of like he's praying and he's definitely looking at the folks in the other panel, right? Now, the gentleman in blue, he's got his arm around this guy kind of like a pal or a friend, perhaps. He's holding a book with a rock on it. Hmm, interesting. And then the other panel, we've got a very interesting situation here. Um, if you noticed that the anatomy of the lady um, in this beautiful throne is not quite accurate, you would be correct. However, we have this wonderful woman clearly being depicted as a queen, and she's holding a small baby, and they are surrounded by red angels and blue angels. Now, I already gave you a clue that this would be a religious painting because I did say it's a diptych and it would be in a place of worship, okay? But let's read this together, okay? Because this might give us some clues on the color red and how this artist is using the color red. So first of all, let's start with this panel on the right. Here we have this gentleman in blue with a beautiful gold trim. And that is a reference to Saint Stephen, who is the patron saint of the donor who we see here. This is the gentleman who paid for this diptych to be created. And his name, Etienne Chevalier, Etienne is French for Stephen. So this is Etienne Chevalier, the patron, and his patron saint, Saint Stephen. And I think that's really cool because we're starting to see that red is reserved for the human and blue is reserved for the saint, right? Human, divine, earth, heaven secular, spiritual. Interesting, is it not? Now, we see um, the human here, Etienne Chevalier, in a, a pose of prayer or supplication, uh, looking at the, uh, the folks here on the right. And here we have Saint Stephen. How do we also know it's a saint and that it's Stephen in particular? Well, yes, we have the reference to the donor, and he has his arm around him, kind of implying that they have a relationship, but we don't see a halo. Now, you could suggest that the gold references here on the, or the details on his blue robe could be kind of like a halo, but here's the thing, he's holding a book, and the book has a stone on it. This would be St. Stephen's symbol or attribute. It's the clue to let us know which saint this is, and he, oh, a lot of saints are depicted with a symbol and it's how they were martyred or, or tortured. And in this case, St. Stephen was stoned to death. So he holds a stone as his symbol or attribute. That's kind of rough, right? 
Now in this uh, image on the right, there's a lot going on. There's a lot to unpack, but don't worry. We'll do it together. Let's take a closer look. So we have this beautiful woman who's very pale, yes? And so is her baby, but she is definitely depicted as a queen, right? She's in this beautiful blue dress. Look at this white fur cape. And just to drive the point home, we see her on this incredible throne wearing a crown that has beautiful jewels and pearls attached to it. So who do you think this is? If you guess that this is the Virgin Mary holding baby Jesus, you would be correct. Why is she in the guise of a queen? It implies that she is the queen of heaven. Also with her breast exposed, it's an emphasis on the fact that she is a mother. It is a maternal reference and that she is the mother of Jesus. Now this blue dress, hmm, a queen is wearing it and the queen of heaven and Saint Stephen was also wearing blue. So here we see this emphasis that blue is being reserved for the more divine figures, especially if it's a religious painting. Now we've got these babies with wings, they're angels, and you see that some are red and some are blue. The cherubim are the blue angels. They're important because um, in the story of Mary, she does not die. She actually falls into a deep sleep called a dormition. And then the blue angels, the cherubim, accompany her soul to heaven. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then the red angels are the seraphim and they are the highest ranking angels. Did you know there were levels of angels? There are in art history, that's pretty cool. So we've just read these two paintings and boy, red plays a very powerful role, doesn't it? Let's move on. Um, we just looked at a religious painting. Let's look at a mythological painting and see the power of the color red. Um, this is a piece by Raphael. It's the story of Galatea, the triumph of Galatea painted 1512 to 1514-ish. What is the story of Galatea? Galatea was a sea nymph and she was in love with a shepherd boy named Asus. Now there are different variations to this story as there always are, but in this particular case, she wants to be with the shepherd boy Asus. However, the Cyclops is enamored of her and he wants to be with her, but she doesn't wanna be with him. That happens a lot in mythology, we've already seen on a few occasions, right? So what happens, this is the triumph of Galatea. That means she, her heart's desire is accomplished. She triumphs because she actually gets to be with Asus and is rescued away from the Cyclops. How do we know that that's what's going on in this painting? Let's take a closer look. So here we have Galatea right here in the middle of this painting. She is our heroine. And do you notice that she's wearing this beautiful bright red cloak and not much else, right? But she's a sea nymph, so that makes sense. Do you see that she's on this beautiful chariot made of a giant shell with the two scariest dolphins I've ever seen in my life and she's in her chariot being whisked away from the Cyclops so that she can be reunited with her true love, the shepherd boy. Here we have all different kinds of creatures, a merman, other sea nymphs, um, some satyrs over here. Um, and to drive the point home uh, that uh, Galatea is triumphant, we have three puti up here, little cherub babies with their little wings, and they're all aiming their arrows right at Galatea to make sure that she falls in love with the right person, right? Um, I love Raphael, oh, he's so great with his little bits of humor, right? Look at the little cherub over here, he's holding the extra arrows. He's like, hey, if you guys run out of arrows, I, I got extra ones for you. So what's interesting about this painting is it's the story of a sea nymph. So, and it takes place in the ocean. 
don't you think it would be mostly blues and greens that we would be seeing in this painting? Yeah, why is Galatea wrapped in this beautiful bright red cloak? Well, number one, she's in the center of the painting and this red cloak really draws our eye to Galatea, the heroine of this story, right? Also, if you think about it, red being associated with love and passion, she's quite literally wrapped in love. I think that's really cool. Um, driving the love message home, we have our Puti shooting their arrows of love. I wonder who sent those Puti. If you thought Venus, the goddess of love, you would be correct. And to make sure that everything falls into place, we have Cupid down here. He's got his wings, he's got a little pink robe. How sweet is that? And do you notice he's pointing the way? He's like showing the way um, that the dolphins should go to make sure that Galatea is drawn away from the Cyclops and reunited with her true love. That's so sweet. Because Galatea is in this bright red, we see her, she stands out, and she is our hero because she is reunited with the one she loves. Good job, Raphael. Well done. Let's move into modern art for a hot minute, shall we? Is red still important in modern art? Well, I'll let you be the judge. Has anybody ever seen this painting? This is by Matisse, and it's called The Dessert or Harmony in Red. And I think that's really interesting. It's definitely a red room. This was painted about 1908. What if I told you, though, that it was originally commissioned to be Harmony in Blue? Does that change your interpretation of this painting? Imagine if the blue details were swapped and it was a blue room with red detail. Does that change how you see this painting? It probably does, because this red really stands out. I gotta ask too, is this a happy scene or a sad scene? It's kind of hard to tell. Our servant here looks very Oh, subdued. I mean, she is working. It looks like she's setting up a beautiful feast. It looks like she's setting up maybe even for a party. However, I don't know. It's kind of contradictory. I, I think it's a happy thing. Some people think it's a sad thing. I don't know. One last thing before we leave this painting. Do you see this rectangle here? Is that a window? looking outside, or is it a painting hanging on the wall of this room? I'm not gonna tell you. You have to guess, you have to decide for yourself. You're at a point where you can do that. You're flexing your art history muscles and I'm so proud of you. Now let's look at the work of this artist. We have seen a few paintings by this gentleman already. If you said, hey, I think those are paintings by Caravaggio, you're right, both of these are. Uh, it's actually the same image. However, this is what it looks like in its uh, final destination. Um, these, uh, this painting is in the Santa Maria del Popolo in Rome. Um, and it depicts a religious scene called Conversion on the Way to Damascus. It's the story of how Saul becomes Paul. Do we know that story? Saul was a guy who was persecuting the members of the early Christian church after Jesus died and what have you. Um, and he was on his way to Damascus when he sees a bright light that quite literally knocks him off of his horse. And the voice from the light says, why are you persecuting me? And it's Jesus. And he's basically called out. He's like, hey, you're persecuting my people, the early Christians, um, knock it off. Uh, so what happens is Saul becomes Paul and he actually becomes a champion for the early Christian church. Um, writes a bunch of books of the New Testament. You know him, I know you do. Um, however, Caravaggio has really chosen an interesting format to depict this scene. He's not atop his horse. He is actually down here on the ground, but do you notice how he's reaching up? 
Now this is very interesting because, and one of the reasons why I wanted to show you the painting in the church is because we, the viewer, would be down here, down below. We would be the parallel to St. Paul, implying that we are also reaching up to the heavens for help. Isn't that really cool? Now, we're talking about the color red here, right? Do you notice we've got our classic Caravaggio with the dark background, this very intense beam of light, his atenebrism, if you will, reflecting off the beautiful coloring of this horse. Um, and where's Paul? He's down here at the ground. But to make sure that we see him, he's draped him in red. It's a little faded over time, but he is in this beautiful red to draw our eye down to him. So Caravaggio is kind of like the M. Night Shyamalan of the Italian Baroque period, right? Because it's not necessarily that it means something, it's to draw our eye to an important part of the scene. And that's what M. Night Shyamalan does in a lot of his work. Look, um, this particular painting has a companion piece and it is the crucifixion of St. Peter. Yeah, I know, they're kind of challenging topics, especially if they're in a church, but you know, they're painted to make you feel something. Um, and I want you to notice classic Caravaggio, dark background, the intense beam of light like a spotlight, which we call tenebrism, but where is the red in this painting of the conversion of St. Peter? Do you notice it's right here on this guy and how that creates a lot of drama in this scene. Caravaggio, known for his theatrics in art, look at this. We have a really cool diagonal line going right here and the opposite of that is this beautiful diagonal line going down here that's created with the rope and this gentleman's back. And it's interesting that he put the red here because then we follow this line here to really focus on St. Peter and his anguish at having to be crucified. And it wasn't just that he was being crucified. He did not want to detract from the way in which his savior Jesus died. So he asked to be crucified upside down. Yikes. But what's interesting about that is See how Paul is on the ground reaching up? That puts Peter closer to the ground where again, we the viewer would be inside that church. So we're supposed to actually connect with these characters who are reaching out to the heavens for help. Cool, right? I know. So Let's look at two more images by Caravaggio. Now that I've kind of given you a, a, a hint as to what he's doing with the color red, you totally see it now, right? We have our dark background. This is his painting, The Supper at Emmaus from about 1600-ish. Um, and do you notice the red is reserved for Christ and the innkeeper who has come and brought them their lunch. The story of the supper at Emmaus is that um, two of the apostles are walking along the road. They're headed to Emmaus so that they can preach. And they're joined by a figure who they don't recognize right away. They invite him to lunch, they sit down, and it's as this mysterious figure blesses the food, they realize, oh my goodness gracious, it's Jesus. How did we not recognize you? And then poof, he disappears. How awesome is that? Caravaggio's decided, I'm going to paint the instant before Jesus disappears because you see the apostles here are reacting as if they just realized they've been reunited with their best friend, Jesus, and they didn't even realize it. And what is very cool about this painting is that Jesus is in red, definitely implying his human side. And it, emphasizing the fact that he's with them bodily as a human, not as a spirit. And what's very cool is that we see that this uh, innkeeper who has brought them their food is also wearing a hint of red just to emphasize the humanity of this scene right before Jesus's divinity kicks in and he disappears. That's pretty cool, right? Now in this image on the right, 
we see a figure cloaked in red. And I have to tell you the story of this figure because he's gonna come up again in some future videos. And this is Saint Jerome in his study from about 1605, again by Caravaggio. Now, Saint Jerome is considered one of the four Latin fathers of the Catholic Church. Why is that? Well, first of all, he's the guy that says, you know what? Let's take the whole Bible and translate it into Latin. And, and people were like, okay, that, that sounds like a thing we could do. So we see him here studying hard at work with his texts. Um, he was also the guy that was like, you know, we don't give the Virgin Mary enough credit. Let's start venerating her a little bit more. And people were also like, yeah, that sounds cool too. So we'll do that. He's often depicted in three guises, as a hermit, a scholar, and as a cardinal of the Catholic Church. Cardinals wear red, cardinal birds are red also, and that's what we're seeing here. Caravaggio's taken all three of those guises and merged them into one, seeing uh, Saint Jerome here in his study draped in the color red. So with St. Jerome being draped in this beautiful red, that's the reference to being a cardinal of the church. Um, the fact that we see him studying these uh, holy books is his uh, guise as a scholar. And the fact that he's older and totally naked under this beautiful red cloak is definitely a hint at his guise as a hermit. I don't know if you know this, but um, hermits can just stop wearing clothes. They retreat into nature and they spend their days praying and they typically don't wear clothes, at least in art history. To make sure we know that he's in his hermit mode as well, Caravaggio's included a skull, a memento mori, if you will, a reference to the idea that life is fleeting, so make the most of it a remember that we all die. That's the actual Latin translation of memento mori. I know, pretty cool, huh? Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video where we've talked about the color red. Um, if you have, maybe throw a couple of coins in my virtual tip jar. Um, please, if you can't do that, which is totally cool, maybe like my videos or share them with your friends and family. Um, maybe subscribe to my YouTube channel. All of that helps. And thank you so much for tuning into these videos. Um, I love making them, so I hope you enjoy watching them. And I will definitely see you next time. Thanks. Bye.